This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and whoops. <laughs> Looks like I accidentally cut that out when I added Adam in. Either way, doesn't matter. We are live. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast. Today, we're going to be diving into negotiating commercial real estate leases. Yes, they are negotiable. That is one of the first questions I get asked. Can you actually negotiate these? Yeah, they're not like that apartment lease that you signed right out of college. Uh, just about everything in them can be negotiated. We're going to talk about common pitfalls or clauses that you should have uh, in your lease and some that are uncommon, but absolutely necessary and tips for negotiating your next lease. Joined by Adam Williams and Chad Griffiths today for this Brokers Roundtable. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Hey, good to be here, Tyler. Good to see you too, Adam. Happy to be here. Hey, guys. I'm looking yeah, forward to diving about, in. Sorry about the technical difficulties, Adam. I got to get that Google Meet <laughs> removed from the uh, from the calendar invite. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about negotiating leases. I mean, that's that's like commercial real estate 101. Uh, when you, whether you're a broker or a landlord or a tenant, you've got to know how to negotiate leases properly so that you can better set yourself up for success over the long run, because you're going to be in these contracts for three to five, 10 plus years. So it's very important that you get it right on the front end. Adam, I'm going to kick it off with you because you're on the retail front. And I think people will probably be more familiar with some terms that you might talk about in retail than industrial with Chad. But we also want to talk about industrial because there's a lot of people buying industrial today. But Adam, I'm going to kick it over to you first. Yeah, I'd say that all retail leases in general, they're very different than office leases, very different than industrial leases, because retail is very typically used to amenitize a larger project, right? So we look at leases very different in a power center where you're doing, you know, deal with you know, Old Navy and World Market versus kind of your neighborhood services and infill center. Very, very different leases. And the main thing that makes them so different is the credit involved, right? We, there's, a, there's a saying that I picked up a little while back in retail that says you can be cool or you can be rich, but it's really hard to do both, right? There's not a lot of really cool brands that also have great credit in the retail world. Now there are some, you've got the L Catterton brands, the, the big boy national and international private equity backed brands that also still have some cool factor. Um, you know, Bartaco, Barcelona, you know, there's Postino wine. I mean, there's certainly some, you know, Sam Fox still, uh, is able to keep some cool factor and has big credit, but you're going to pay for that with a, with a, you know, a, you're going to have some scar tissue when you're done working out those leases with those guys. But uh, credit is, a, is just a massive driving factor in retail leases, right? Everybody wants to dwell on, uh, on the face rent value number. And, you know, it's either going to work with the performer or it's not. There's not some massive swings in room in, in what people are asking for versus where they need to be. And it's also a, a massive function of tenant improvement allowance. But credit is where the rubber really meets the road. And it's very common in office leases to overcome that with like a letter of credit situation um, or, you know, a huge security deposit. And again, a lot of retailers, if they are cool, it's like the sous chef of the hot restaurant that's spinning off to do uh, his own thing. He's going to look at you like he heard a dog talk uh, when you ask him for a you know $150,000 letter of credit. So that's something that you're going to come across and, and, and fight with. It's, it is the crux of, you know, 85% of every retail deal that I do. Yeah. Credit, credit is really important. And I feel like it's one thing that is very misunderstood on the retail front. Can you talk more about what credit is? Because it, it seems to me it's very understood when you're talking about bed, bath and beyond, right? Cause you can look up their credit rating but if you are bad example, they've had a, they've had a rough or, credit. Well, they've had a rough yeah. credit patch. Not, not yes. anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> I guess I, I guess most retailers are going to be tough to pick a good a good credit national retailer anymore. Uh, but like Starbucks, right? You can look up Starbucks's Great credit example. and you know that it's it's got to be really good. But Mass. if I'm buying a, a shopping center that has all small businesses, how do I determine credit? How do I underwrite that? Yeah, it's, it's really hard, right? Because 
for every Starbucks, and that's a great example because they, they sign through their corporate entity, right? You are going to get some Starbucks signature on that deal. But 75% of deals that we do are signed in what's called an SPE, a single purpose entity. And those uh, credit ain't great, right, with, a, with an SPE. So uh, a lot of times the credit rating is just a function of, of how bankable the tenant is, right? So if it's, I'll give it on a sliding scale, you would use Starbucks on one side or Target, right, on, on one side or Walmart or, or you pick your household name. Uh, they would be on one side of the credit spectrum. And then the sous chef that makes great donuts and banh mi's or whatever the hell he makes that's really good or she makes it's really good. Um, but maybe they're just getting a loan from their uncle, right? And they can't show you more than, than 50 grand in the bank. That would be on the other side. And sometimes if it's a second generation space and you really need the deal and you're not putting a ton of TI into it, you're willing to do that deal. But credit is just a function of like how dependable is it that the rent is going to show up in the first uh, on the first of the month? What kind of cash backs this deal? Right. So maybe the guy, maybe it's his first retail or his first restaurant, but he worked as a pharmaceutical sales guy for 15 years and he's got you know five or 10 million in the bank and he's willing to sign a personal guarantee that jumps the credit level and your risk tolerance in a huge way uh, because it's not just you know a guy with a dream that makes great falafel it's a guy that has run a really successful business and is willing to put his assets on the on the line in order to make sure you get your rent payment on the first so that that like it's a super layman example of of credit but that that's you know as simple as it is sometimes Chad, I feel like industrial leases, you know, 10 plus years ago were night and day different from retail leases, but it seems like they're kind of almost coming together to be identical. Can you talk about the differences between industrial leases and, and retail? Yeah, that's a good point. And I'd say that that's largely driven just by very low vacancy rates. Like we're even though vacancy has ticked up over the last six to 12 months, we're still even below pre pandemic levels. So when you have ultra low vacancy, it, it put t tilts the favor into the landlord. So we have seen a lot more uh, landlords starting to request things that are familiar in Adam's world. And credit is a huge one. But there, it's it's very uncommon for a landlord to not go in depth on a tenant's financial statements to really get a sense of what they're dealing with. And they can look for all sorts of things. They might want to see a pattern of revenue growth, or they might want to see a certain amount in retained earnings. But very simply, they, at the at the very least, they're going to want to see that they have an expense line item that's covering rent. Because if a company doesn't have an expense line item for rent, what does that mean if they have to add in? a new amount or perhaps a much bigger amount than they had been paying. And what a landlord's looking to do is just cover their risk. No different than if you if they treated themselves as a bank. Is the client or the tenant in this case able to repay that debt or are they able to pay their bills? And I think that that's come a long way where in the past, landlords might have been more lenient. They might have done a credit check or a reference check and and that might have satisfied them. But now they're, they're realizing that in a tight market, there's an opportunity cost of putting a tenant in there that might not perform because if they had just waited a little longer, they might have gotten a better tenant and not have had to go through collections and evictions and just all the headache and stress that goes with it. So I'd say that we definitely have seen more of an emphasis of landlords look to do more in-depth background checks on who they're actually leasing space to. Now, I know everybody uh, in, the, in the group here has, has represented both landlords as well as tenants. Let's talk about looking at financials. What, what do landlords want to see and what do tenants want to share? Because that can often be two very different things. Let's start from the landlord perspective. Let's assume that you're representing a landlord with uh, you know a vacant building and you're, and you're talking to a tenant. What financials are you going to want to see from those tenants? And what are you going to specifically be looking at within them? Adam, we'll start with you. I, I wanna know how sophisticated these guys are when it comes to accounting, right? It's very simple. Like, can they produce a balance sheet? That Can they produce a P&L? How many years have they been in business? Like, show me a track record that shows success and then obviously assets, like if we're, if either, 
it's all about the signing entity. Like who is that signing entity, right? Like, cause go back to the Starbucks example. Let's say that Starbucks wants to do a deal with you, but they're not signing the deal. It's, it's an, it's another, it's another entity, right? Like I want to understand what is the actual signing entity, unless there's a, a rider of a guarantee being, being attached to it. I want to understand that entity. So, uh, basic accounting, basic PFS, uh, personal financial statement, or you know, balance sheet, PL, PL, and just assets and, and track record. I mean, I don't think that I've ever seen two landlords ask for the exact same thing. They all want tax returns. They all want a uh, balance sheet. They all want a PL, but I don't think I've ever seen two landlords ask for the exact same kind of package of financials. Yeah, it's funny. I've had some landlords have some very interesting requests uh, in the past, but it, to me, it's always been two to three years of tax returns, a personal yep. financial statement, and then we'll probably do a credit check. Um, if the credit check doesn't come back, we're probably looking at bank statements, you know, three to six months of bank statements. And that's the great thing about commercial real estate, right? You could never do this in, a, in the apartment world because you have fair housing acts. You cannot do this kind of stuff. But since we're in commercial we're diving into businesses this isn't personal this is a business decision we get to we get to ask for all of that stuff chad what about you yeah on the industrial side i'd say it's mostly common just to ask for a couple of years of financial statements so balance sheet income statement we'd only dive digger dive deeper if we were per having the tenant personally indemnify it which isn't overly common unless it's a new business or there's a lot of tenant improvements usually the company should have the strength to stand on its own. So like I mentioned, you want to see retained earnings, you want to see some trajectory of income growth, top line growth, bottom line growth, uh, and do they have the capacity to pay their rent uh, as an itemized line item on their uh, expense sheet. So th those would be the general things. It gets more nuanced and complex if the company does have some financial issues, because then we start di diving into all those personal things that you guys are mentioning as well. How do y'all feel about personal guarantees? I mean, at what point do they become an absolute necessity? I mean, whenever I'm looking at smaller businesses that have a newer LLC, if it's an LLC that's signing on the lease, I'm, per I'm having tenants personally guarantee it. Sometimes we'll get around that by just having the tenants personally sign the lease. Um, I'd be curious to know if y'all prefer the personal guarantee or have the tenants sign the lease and have like a doing business as, but Chad, we'll, we'll start that off with you. Yeah, it's interesting. Usually those would be on smaller spaces, like a, like a small bay industrial space. Uh, in the larger properties, you're usually just dealing with sophisticated companies that, that have the capacity to do it. But on those small ones, it, it's the full spectrum. There are some landlords out there that do want to have a full personal guarantee or they might want to have the tenant sign. There might be some that just accept that with small bay industrial comes the fact that you're typically going to be dealing with smaller industrial tenants uh, or even first time companies. And some people might take a little bit more risk. They might take a flyer on someone and say, well, this this is what it is. In a hot market though, they tend to be a little bit more selective and increase their criteria. It's interesting, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this as well, is that a personal guarantee, especially in these small spaces, are very hard to enforce because it's you're sometimes you're trying to get blood out of a rock. Uh, if the company's not paying their rent it's very hard to say, well, they probably don't have any, or they probably don't have a whole lot that they have in their in their personal name anyways. And then there's the optics of going and uh, suing someone on their personal guarantee to try and get a judgment on it. If it's a big company doing it, that doesn't reflect well that this big company's chasing this small business owner who failed. So I, I've found that, especially on the small ones, it's often not even worth it to pursue uh, these, these com uh, people individually. But there's certainly something to be said that there somebody has a responsibility, even a mental one, if they're personally signing their name off. But I can't think of a single example in 18 years that I've been in this business where a big landlord has chased a small tenant that personally guaranteed their name, their name, uh, and and failed to pay their rent. I can't think of a single one where it actually went to court. I think you hit the nail on the head, which is it's mental, right? Like these guys. You don't want them to just kind of you know, pick up their their stakes and move on um, when they've had a rough quarter, right? I, I think the I think the mental attitude of having that personal guarantee there really does matter. But I would echo your sentiment that these things are almost impossible to enforce, especially for somebody with a failing business. But 
I want to touch on one thing that really differs in your world. I say your world, industrial world versus your retail world. And, and it's really coming down to like a merchandising mix, right? Because if you've got, call it 25 or 30,000 square feet, which in, in my world is a good little chunk of, of infill space, you, it, you're really trying to build an ecosystem, right? So if you want to do the bank deal and get the bank level, you get Chase or TD or you know, one of these great bank uh, guarantees that makes your bank and your equity happy, you got to balance that out with something cool, right? Nobody wants to live in an apartment complex or, you know, have, have you know, this really cool corner of a great uh, retail destination and you've got a bank and, a, you know, pick another couple of vanilla users, right? You've got to, you've got to kind of mix that up. So in my world, you're more likely to take a flyer on the sous chef if you're able to get the, you know, the, uh, urgent care with a huge corporate backing or your bank or, you know, whatever boring institution you you have to do to make the equity and the, the bank guys happy, then you're willing to take a flyer on the guy with the risky credit because he adds the cool factor. So you're like spreading out your risk a little bit. So you're willing to, you're willing to take a little bit of flyer. You're willing to kind of squint when you look at the financials a little bit. Uh, if you, if you have somebody else involved that, you know, you can count on. Yeah, I mean, we did something very similar to that a couple of years ago on a, a shopping center. Uh, it was well, it was mixed use. It had apartments above that one of our clients built. We ended up getting a regional bank to sign uh, a lease, and then I told them, like, guys, you want a restaurant in the front? That's the one that we got to kind of take a flyer on. And we ended up getting a, a local group from that neighborhood to open their restaurant there from a food truck. So, I mean, I think it it's it's all about the balance, right? Because you don't want to have too many corporate tenants, but those corporate tenants help with the valuation of the building. They help with your, your window getting comfortable with the yeah. deal. Yeah. Make it so um, much, so much better. Yeah. They, I mean, they, they really changed the the face of kind of the investment side of the deal. One other thing that I, I use with landlords to kind of get them over the hump on a deal like that, right? Like there ain't no credit associated with the food truck guy that wants to start his first restaurant, right? It's just, that is a risk and there's no way to sell around that. But one thing that I have had a lot of success making landlords understand, and this isn't me you know, bullshitting, this is the this is something that I've, I've, I've seen play out a hundred times. You've got that raw shell. That might be worth 34 bucks a foot net, right? And you're gonna put 80 bucks, 100 bucks a foot into that TI in order to get your, and sometimes more, more than that. I've done some really high TI deals here lately, but you're going to, let's just use a round number. You're going to put 100 bucks into that deal, and there's no way to underwrite that credit risk. But the bottom line is if you have rights on how this thing is built, if you have rights to approve their construction drawings, and they're putting that $100 in writing, they're going to agree to put that $100 into infrastructure, right? Mechanical, electrical, plumbing, baby. That, that's what makes my world go around venting also. Um, if they're going to put that 100 bucks into that, even if you have to rip out the whole front of house because they wanted to do a ramen bar and it's in the middle of July when you're trying to lease it, nobody wants to do a ramen deal in the middle of the summer because it's 115 degrees in Charlotte. That back of house, $100, is going to turn that thirty-four fifty dollars space into thirty-eight dollar a foot space, and you're going to rent it like that because second generation restaurants are gold if they're in a good location. So that is another thing that some landlords get that, some landlords don't because they're like, wait a minute, you're telling me that I'm going to have to release this thing, and it's not necessarily that you're going to have to release it. It's that that hundred dollar a foot isn't just getting burned into the ether, right? That is going to get used towards you know hard cost. It's not even honestly TI, right? It's CapEx. Somebody's got to spend that CapEx, right? Because raw shell space is, you know, is not all that marketable. So uh, I know that's not necessarily a, a lease execution data point, but it, I think it has to enter into the equation somewhere. Yeah. Let's, let's dive further into that because I see so many different delivery conditions today than, than I used to five or 10 years ago. I mean, you've got landlords that are trying to do cold, dark shell and give a tenant 75 bucks a foot to build it out versus, you know, maybe a, a vanilla box, which I think tenants are much more familiar and comfortable with. Um, so, I mean, let's, Adam, I'll kick it over to you first since you're you're dealing with a lot of this, right? Because I know in the retail world, especially like 
every landlord has a different set of delivery conditions Everyone. that they want to deliver. And it creates a massive, massive headache, uh, both on the leasing side, but also the, the tenant side. What, what delivery conditions should somebody be providing their building in? And then how do you determine what the tenant improvements will be above and beyond that? There's no, there's no right answer. Uh, but what I would say is it comes back to merchandising, right? Let, let, let's go back to that 30,000 square foot example, right? Like, you know that you've got this one pin corner that would work perfectly for a restaurant. It's got a patio. It's got the visibility. It's got access to ingress, egress, loading dock, trash, whatever, whatever that is. You want that to be your restaurant. It's 5,000 feet. Works out perfectly. You've really got to dial into that delivery condition to make sure the MEP is, is sufficient for a restaurant, right? It's got to have the power. It's got to have the water. It's got to have the venting. Um, you know, you've got to have a place to put all the shit that goes into making a, making a successful restaurant, right? So it comes down that work letter. If it's a sophisticated developer or a developer that is smart enough to hire a sophisticated owner's rep, right? you can help help them build their work letter in a manner that's going to save them orders of magnitude on the on the ti budget right because you're not just going to throw it away i've seen people do it in a smart way and then be able to offer what i would consider a market ti after their delivery condition and i've seen people offer it in a bare bones way because it helped their perform on the front end and then they have to go and either mothball a space or spend three X on the back end to go fix the stuff that they should have done on the front end. So I don't think that there is a magic bullet on delivery condition and the landlord work letter. I think it's more of starting really early, getting an architect that you either use a separate core and shell architect from for the you know, a lot of retails tail wagging the dog when you're talking urban, right? You've got 300 units above and 15,000 square foot on the ground floor, but you got to make the ground floor cool in order to lease the, the units up top, right? So it comes down to understanding what you want to put in there. And then you're building the work letter uh, in, a, in a sufficient manner. Yeah, I mean, there's really- the work letter for a per shop looks totally different than a work letter for a uh, you know, full service restaurant. Yeah. Or a dental office, right? They all have completely right. different build outs. And, you know, I mean, there's there's really pros and cons to each, right? I mean, in a cold, dark shell, you have the flexibility to go run plumbing for a dentist, a restaurant, or you could do a salon or a purse shop, right? It, it doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, typically as a landlord, you can probably charge a little bit lower on the rate to find a good tenant and just give them the money to finish it out and you don't have to deal with it. But tenants don't typically like that, right? They'd rather move into a second generation space or something that needs a little less work. They're willing to pay a little bit more for it because they're going to have to, right? The infrastructure is already there. Uh, but, you know, again, it just depends on, on what kind of program you want. Chad, I know industrial is a little bit different on the tenant improvement side. Are you all seeing a lot of that in the industrial sector today? And what does that look like? Yeah, it's interesting. And I'd say it's the full spectrum. So there might be a private guy that owns one building and if he has a vacancy come up he might do the bare minimum he might just say well let's wait and see what ten the tenant comes and we'll see what they want and then we'll do it from there i've found on the institutional side though it's the other end where uh, one client that i deal with is a large uh reit what they do when they have a vacancy is they'll go in they'll replace all the lighting with led in the warehouse so new led lighting They'll typically power wash the floors. If it's drywall, demising walls, they'll paint the, the drywall white in the warehouse. So the warehouse will actually, even if it's an older class B building, it will look very modern with new paint and LED lights. And then they'll typically go in and renovate the office, they'll paint, carpet, uh, new ceiling tiles. And they'll have that almost in a show suite condition and they'll do that automatically any vacancy comes up they'll just go and do it and they recognize that some companies might want to come in and paint walls their company color or make some minor changes but they've just found that having that space look as presentable as possible essentially a move-in condition gives them a little bit of an edge what is it right or is is the guy who just says well let's see who comes in and then we can build it a la carte on on what they want it's different strategies work at different times and in a really low vacancy market, I think both strategies have shown that they work. So I don't know, know if one's better than the other, but having shown an old tired industrial space and having showing 
ones that are have been recently renovated the latter always shows better and it always gets much more positive feedback so i'd say it's a full spectrum ones like that the landlord is probably going to be a lot more reticent to give out ti's if they've already spent money building the space out uh, but industrial is also unique in the fact that there can be an endless amount of requirements that a tenant has they might want an extra door put in there might be a dock door that they want to have ramped they might need a crane all sorts of combinations that can happen that require a personalized approach specific to that individual company so it it varies but there's also a lot of deals that get done where a company can just move into a space and they make do with what they have and it's just ready to go for them so it really is an interesting asset class not to say that office and retail isn't either because i'm sure there's a lot of variables that go into that but it's just it it's really hard to paint uh industrial with one brush because there's so many variables and factors that go into it yeah, that's really interesting. It sounds to me like you're saying it's almost better, even if it's marginal, to go ahead and fix the space up and get it ready for the next tenant, even if they're going to come in and, and repaint something. I mean, office is kind of the same way. I'll take that. Uh, I'll, I'll take that asset class on today since Jesse's not with us. But office is kind of the same way. I mean, if you can go ahead and, and put new new carpets in, new paint, you know, maybe upgrade the lighting to LED, tenants are much more likely to just sign a lease and move right in. Uh, Adam what do you see on the retail front? I mean, I would imagine it's probably the opposite. I mean, you're expecting tenants to come in and do a full makeover because they, they typically have heavier branding. Yeah. The trade dress in my world is everything. Right. <clears throat> and I, and I, I go through this with, with large landlords kind of from the begin, beginning, like from the bones of the project. Right. I'll give you a kind of a simple example. We'll go back to the 300 unit multifamily, example, right? If you're building this monolithic straight up and down building and you expect a, a high level sophisticated retail tenant to take the ground floor and there's very little opportunity for them to distinguish their storefront from the rest of your building, you got big problems, right? Because they feel like their brand is getting compressed so heavily from the, from the top down if it's so obviously a top-down construction project and development project, you're going to struggle, right? Like, so these guys uh, having their ability to, to express their brand is, is massive. So uh, to answer your question, yes, you need to give these people a tremendous amount of, of leeway to express their brand and to build out exactly what they want to do because it's so experiential, right? It's completely opposite of the industrial, like none of your customers are ever going to see your your, you know, how the sausage is made on an industrial side. You want it to be clean. You want it to be efficient. You want it to be sophisticated for your use, but not exactly gorgeous, right? Uh, retail is, is very, very different. So you want to give a retailer the opportunity to express their brand. Um, and, and it really starts from how the building is, is designed. Um, and second generation is extremely, I would say it's like a sliding scale. The less sophisticated the retailer, the more important the second generation aspect is, right? Because they can get in cheap, they can make some compromises to make the space work, right? A really sophisticated brand that's backed by El Catterton or you know Starbucks, they're like, no, nah, we're just gonna demo all that shit out anyway. Am I allowed to curse, Tyler? I've cursed now three yeah, times. Yeah, I don't care. It's curse. fine. So, <laughs> we're all um, here. <laughs> yeah, make sure. Um, so it, it, it's, it is a sliding scale, right? So somebody wants to come in and just get a deal done. They want second generation, but if, if it's a, the more sophisticated, the more likely they're just going to demo out all the second generation stuff anyway. Yeah. Cause they want it to fit their specific brand specs to a T. I mean, you're never exactly. going to find Starbucks moving into a second generation coffee shop and just making it work. Right. 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 Like it it still says matter. caribou like behind it, it through the paint, <laughs> yeah. just through the paint. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, Ramiro is saying, thanks for these live events and your content. Learned so much as a beginner commercial real estate investor. Absolutely, Ramiro. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Ron's got a pretty interesting one. Co-tenancy provisions. Those can be brutal. Uh, he's saying center vacancy drops, NOI drops. Then that tenant gets to reduce rent again. Double whammy. Uh, Chad, I don't know if there are any co-tenancy provisions in the industrial world, but I uh, would love to get your thoughts on that. Adam, I know you deal with this all the time. I mean, we've got some wild co-tenancy provisions that we've had to deal with in shopping centers, like 
Kroger not allowing another bakery to open up and considering a donut shop down the street to be considered a bakery. Uh, so how do you deal with that from the landlord's perspective? Chad, you want you want to start? Is there anything like that in industrial? It, it would be rare, but there there's certainly one off scenarios. And interestingly, Ron has a building himself. Ron's a lawyer and uh, an investor based out of Dallas. He's got a building where he rents out. It's an industrial building. He rents out units inside the building to numerous different tenants. And he almost draws an imaginary line where the where where the space would be partitioned off and and to me that is a cool way of taking a building which otherwise might be limited because it's an older industrial building might be limited in how much rent you can get but by breaking it into smaller tenants he's able to do it that's not something that i don't i don't know if i have the interest in doing that myself as an investor or what i would advise someone else to do for the reasons that Ron alludes to is that it's difficult coming up with an arrangement where you appease everybody and mitigate any risk that can arise from having co-tenants uh, in there. So what I would say is if anyone is entertaining that idea is to make sure you've got a very strongly worded agreement that that identifies those potential pitfalls. And that's why you'd want to have a, a lawyer like Ron drafting that up to to alleviate those concerns in advance. Uh, but it, it wouldn't be overly common in industrial. Like one out of a thousand, you might see a scenario like that. So hyper, hyper common in my world, and it cuts both ways. So we have the the provisions that that gentleman mentioned where, you know, if you if I'm paying a lot to go next to a Kroger, uh, if they go out, that's going to drop your footfalls in your in your center by 75 percent, which means my rent needs to go by down by 75 percent. That's kind of what he was alluding to. And that that's pretty common when you're going into anchored centers. Um, and the, the other side, which is honestly just as much of a, of a pain in the ass in my world is exclusives. Right. So oh, yeah. um, a, a lot of a lot of those people like Victoria's Secret is not going to sign a lease unless they get Athleta or Lulu and yada, 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 right? Like a few other kind of herd mentality kind of kind of retailers. But then they also, once you get the Lulu or the Athleta, they're going to make damn sure that, uh, or they're going to try their best to make sure that you can't get one of their competitors in. And, you know, it's, you want to, as a landlord, be like, hey, man, I'm a good guy. I'm not going to go and put one of your competitors right next to you. Just trust me. Um, but then you also have, uh, tenants that will really stretch, right? Like Victoria's Secret, for example, they sell leggings also, right? So you get into these, this minutia of, you know, percentage of sale clauses, uh, like the donut, the bakery thing, like how much percentage of what they do is bread versus donuts or with Dunkin' Donuts, they don't sell any freaking donuts. It's all coffee, right? You get into you end up having to get in people's business way more than you want or need to, because once you start agreeing to exclusives in a center, it, I mean, I've got some centers that the book of exclusives looks like that. And, you know, every time you do a deal, you've got to get an attorney to kind of pick through it with a fine tooth comb to make sure you can even do the deal. So it is very common. And you know, we spend a lot of time in my world, kind of navigating those things. So that was a good question from, uh, from that person. Yeah, I, I, we have to deal with that all the time. I mean, like we, we dealt with it at the wash, right? I mean, we've got tenants to come in. Every single one of those restaurants wants an exclusive on a specific type of food. And we had to get very specific with what that was. It wasn't just, you know, hey, <clears throat> I want an exclusive on Asian food, right? Because, you know, Mongolian barbecue is very different from pho. So we can't grant a, an exclusive on Asian food because you could have two different businesses in the center that aren't a tr are, are not competitive with each other. But if they had that exclusive, that would prevent a sushi restaurant from going in. Again, nobody else would be making sushi, but you're you're completely eliminating that. So, you know, as a landlord, you want to be very conscientious of how how general or specific these exclusivity clauses are because it can get you into a lot of trouble. Uh, let's talk about length of term and options. Some tenants want shorter term lengths, somewhat really long 
Um, you know, we're talking three years on the shorter side, maybe even one year, but we don't even bother with that most of the time, all the way up to 10, 15, 20 years sometimes for a base term. Um, you know, how do you guys handle the length of term on your deals? Because a lot of landlords get worried that, you know, in five or 10 years, I'm going to be behind on market rents. I don't want to sign a 10 year lease. Uh, Chad, we'll start off with you because I know in the industrial world, 10 year, seven, 10 year deals are, are relatively common. Yeah, I'd say right now that probably is the most common. But what's so crazy about our industry is that maybe not so much right now with the higher interest rate environment that we've come into, but call it a year ago, anyone buying a new industrial building or buying an industrial building as an investment, they were looking for short waltz, a weighted average lease term. They specifically wanted short terms on those leases because quite often a lease that was call it three or four years into a five-year lease, it was probably well below market. So if they had a property they could buy that had a lease expiring soon, they could mark that to market and realize some gain on that right away. So it's, it, different investors are going to have different priorities on where they place their emphasis. I personally am more on that long-term side where I'd, I'd like to have the stability of a long-term tenant. Uh, but quite often it's, all, it's driven by the deal itself. So if the company going in there needs a whole bunch of work done on that space, maybe they need to have that crane installed or they need to have a few more doors punched in or heavy power added, that cost will typically just be amortized over the deal. The longer you can do that deal, the cheaper the, the rent is going to be because you're amortizing over a longer period. So it, there's, a, there's a lot of variables that go into it. Uh, I'd say just very Cole's notes. Uh, investors that are opportunistic, they're going to typically want to have deals that are expiring soon, especially if those rents are below market. Whereas there's some investors, uh, the one guy that I point to all the time, Armancio Ortega, who's the founder of Zara, he's got a pretty robust real estate portfolio. And he bought almost a billion dollars worth of industrial real estate last year. And his weighted average lease term was over eight years. So his FedEx and Home Depots and like large, well-known companies that have their distribution centers in these buildings, he wanted that long-term lease rate in there. And, and I imagine he probably fixed his debt matching that lease term or perhaps even longer. And he knows that he's going to get a, the, a predetermined amount of rent. They're all triple net leases. So he knows he's going to make the same return. And it's almost like a bond for him. Uh, so I think you're going to have that full spectrum. You're going to have some opportunistic value add investors who want to immediately add value all the way to the stable value put on cash flow more than anything else. Uh, but what will ultimately drive the length term is quite often just what makes sense for both the tenant and the landlord for that individual space at any given time. Uh, in my world, like sophisticated restaurants, which is a lot of what I deal with or in sophisticated retailers, they all want 10 year terms um, where, and they all want two five year options and they all want to understand their increases. That's where the rubber meets the road on a lot of my deals because institutions want to, um, I, I think one of you guys mentioned this a moment ago, they, they want to be opportunistic, right? They don't want to fall behind you know, CPI or fall behind just a market, right? They're buying in these markets that they expect to have, um, you know, predictable, if not explosive uh, rent growth. So where we always get into a fight really is either on that first option or that second option being fair market value versus fixed increases. And, you know, I've sat on both sides of the table many times. So I, I you know, I feel like I have a little bit of empathy with the other side when I'm, when I'm talking about this stuff, but that fair market value, you get into the potential of multiple appraisals and arbitration and it can get kind of messy. Uh, you think like a, an example in, in my market would be South end 10 years ago, South end rents were in the twenties and now they're in the fifties, right? So you, you've got some donut shop that's in 2000 square feet. And, you know, they got they got a kid going to college and they're paying 20 bucks a foot and now they're up for an option and it's 50. They're out of business potentially. So uh, that that's where term really starts to get a little a little prickly in my world is, you know, how are you going to how are you going to validate those options? Yeah, we, we tend to try and stick to five years. I, I just I like the number. I like the I like the idea of tenure leases, but. 
I mean, it's the same thing here in Nashville as what you were just talking about, Adam. I mean, you know, five years ago where lease rates were compared to where they are today is a night and day difference. And you think uh, as a landlord, how much NOI, how much valuation on your property you're missing out on if I had signed a 10 year lease at 3% annual increases, we wouldn't be anywhere near the, the true value of the property. Uh, we end up, if, if a tenant is adamant about doing five years, we'll sign five years at 3% annual increases. And then the second five years is at 100% of them fair market rates, you know, which, which we determine. And typically the, the evidence that we'll bring to a tenant to say, hey, here's fair market rate is not only like what other, other you know, buildings are leasing for, but here's the last couple of leases that we signed in this building. Right. That's very hard to argue against, uh, you know, an appraisal. Sure. That's that might be one person's opinion. But if you're signing leases at, you know, 30 bucks a foot in the last 12 months on that same building, it's going to be hard for that tenant to argue that it's not 30 bucks a foot. Uh, but, yeah, you do open yourself up to an argument and nobody really wants to have those conversations. Uh, Victoria is saying, greetings. Thank you all for doing this. Who are the main anchors in industrial or even the flex spaces that someone should be seeking to get as a tenant? Chad, I'll lob that one over to you. Who, who should they be going for to, to rent their spaces? I might answer that actually a different way and say that industrial, it's not necessarily as important as building that ecosystem as it is in Adam's world of retail, but there's the potential to add the wrong tenants in there. And th if it's a freestanding building that's a single tenant use, it's not as much of a concern. You really just want to get a good tenant in there that's that's going to be a good fit in the building. But if it's a multi-tenant building, whether it's a flex building or just a multi-tenant uh, business industrial building, I would steer away from certain tenants. So a doggy daycare. The noise, the smell makes it very much a nuisance to surrounding tenants. Uh, uh, auto body shops and car mechanics is another tough one because they typically have broken down cars all over the place. So I would say what would be more important than trying to identify one specific tenant to be an anchor of the center, I'd be just trying to find a mix where everybody is getting along there's no overlap you probably don't want to put two of the same companies beside each other even if they're not retail locations it, it probably just isn't going to be a, a good fit for the one that's already there and then i would avoid some of those certain types of tenants because it, it does create chaos and a, a bit of disharmony when there's one tenant that that affects the other. So I personally, I wouldn't put a whole lot of emphasis on getting one specific tenant in there as much as I'd focus on keeping certain ones out. Yeah, I think that kind of gets us to our next point, which is like unique clauses that you should have in your lease. So, you know, and, and Adam, I'll probably go to you first on this because, you know, like one thing that we've dealt with, we've done, I have done a handful, probably like half of the cycling studios in Nashville. I don't know how we got into that world. We started doing a whole bunch of leases for cycling studios. And one of the biggest issues for them was always noise, always noise. And, you know, we had one landlord that said, you know, hey, I'm not going to put any decibel requirements on you guys. You know, we're good. Don't worry about it. The, the building is soundproofed enough. And we were like, OK, let's get that in writing that you're fine with this. Uh, well, he was a very, very upset landlord when it came down to how loud those classes were. Every other deal that we've done, landlords have always put in those leases some sort of decibel rating, where they're going to read it from. And, you know, if you if you go above that, that it, that will be considered a violation of your lease. We're going to notify you of that. And if you have chronic violations, here's how we're going to handle that. Uh, Adam, in, in what other scenarios have you seen clauses like that within a lease that other landlords should keep in mind when dealing with a specific type of tenant? Yeah, you know, we, we just we lump all of those into like noxious use uses, I guess. Um, and a couple of them, I mean, honestly, the dog one is a really good example because dogs, I mean, are like humans to, to millennials, right? I mean, there's a tremendous market for you know, dog walkers, dog groomers, doggy daycare. So th that's definitely one. Um, food is another like uh, in the more dense a project, the harder it is to, to vent them properly. So you have some people that um, either kind of skirt the rules like they permit as being like a coffee shop when they're going to be cooking 
chicken wings and French fries all day. And so you've just got like horrible smells coming out all, all the time. Nail salons, they smell like hell. Oh yeah. Um, you know, so you, uh, cigar bar, right? Like places like that, that are, I love cigars. Um, but I mean, that, that's a use that you got to know what you're getting into. If, it, if it's, if again, you're trying to build that ecosystem, like Chad said. So, um, we, we lump those into noxious uses. I'm sure if I sat here, uh, with a whiskey and a cigar, I could think of another 50 examples of them. But, uh, those are, those are some off the top of my head that you, you got to know what you're getting into, but you hit the best one uh, sound from fitness studios. Uh, my God, you can spend a hundred grand on the front end, uh, doing, doing it the right way and, and soundproofing it or even less, or you can chase it forever. Um, I can tell you horror stories. Um, I can tell you times we've done it really well. And I can tell you times that, you know, we would pay the tenant any, anything just to go away because it, it causes so much chaos. So that's a, that's a big one. Yeah. I mean, it can be brutal because all your other tenants start complaining. And then usually those tenants will have something in their lease about quiet enjoyment of their space, enjoyment. which means, which means you are as a, as the landlord are basically violating their leases because you're not being able to provide them with that. So it, it can be brutal. I mean, that's why it's so important to have a really good owner's wrap uh, and an attorney involved in all this. Now, Chad, I, I bet it, I bet you've got some really unique things in the industrial world because of the like the the level of concrete that these you know spaces will have, the amount of pounds per square foot that they can actually take in terms of the load bearing and and stuff like that for you know your your forklifts and and heavy items that are and heavy machinery that are getting moved around. So what 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 do you kind of look out for in the industrial world? Yeah, I, I think you nailed that as the use clause becomes pretty important uh, in our space where the landlord wants to fully understand what's being done in there. And if there is a concern, and it could be a forklift in a light industrial building, uh, maybe even that is there's it's probably engineered adequately. But it, I appreciate where you're going with that analogy is that there's, there's always going to be unique cases in there. So I, th I think it does involve a lot of contemplation by the landlord and the tenant to say, well, what is that exactly is happening in your space? And let's make sure that if there's any racking or if there's some mezzanine space that it's not going to cause a problem. I, I'd say even bigger than that one, though, is environmental issues. And that's a category that makes and breaks so many industrial deals uh, is that when it goes to sell, a new purchaser is going to require an environmental site assessment. Ideally, it's just a phase one, but it might go to a phase two where they actually bore holes and test that soil in a lab to see if there's any un unhealthy amounts of contaminant in there. And there's industrial uses that are much worse than others. So if it's a clean wholesaling company and all they're doing is bringing in in pallets with boxes, there's a very, very low probability of any environmental issues. But if it's a chrome plate or dry cleaning, actually, in retail is, is another bad one. But uh, quite often, 395, baby, stay away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. what's interesting, though, is a lot of these dry cleaners, at least in my market now, I don't know if it's everywhere, is that they'll have retail front locations where they accept all the clothes, but they actually send it to warehouses where it's done yeah. uh, in batch in these big warehouses. And that that perk that comes off of that uh, that dry cleaning process is just destroys soil. It can contaminate well beyond just that own property. So there's there's issues on the environmental side. So that's where the use is just so important is the landlord needs to understand what they're doing in there. And there's usually going to be provisions in the lease that says that uh, there aren't any toxic things. There's nothing that uh, will be uh, damaging to the to the environment that they're using in there. But what's a really contentious point and which goes well beyond the scope of what we're trying to do right now is what happens if some contamination is found? Uh, so a company goes into a space and they lease it for 10 years. And even though they might not have done anything in that site, which could have compromised the soil, what happens if when the owner goes to sell it, the buyer goes and actually uncovers that there's contaminant above the acceptable level and it's, it needs to be remedied? What happens in that scenario? Did they, it, it, that, that's what just opens up a whole can of worms on industrial in general, which you'll typically not encounter with office or retail. Uh, but that, that is a major consideration in, in industrial is what's being done there and equally important, what, what happens if an issue arises? That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that 
in terms of like what you could uncover after taking a space back from a tenant because i mean that could lay dormant for years right you're not necessarily just going to go in and run a phase two after every single tenant uh is there so it's definitely something to be aware of on the industrial side well guys this has been a great discussion on negotiating commercial leases things that people should be keeping an eye out for or considering when they're going through this process do you have any final parting advice or tips uh when when landlords are going through the commercial leasing process landlords or tenants either or you know what either hire or. a good freaking attorney it's like cheaping <laughs> out on brakes man don't cheap out on brakes for your car oh yeah attorney your buildings man i've seen tenants sign leases without a, a lawyer oh, on yeah. their side and they just that they without a, a shred of ink on the, t- on the paper yes yeah. they don't negotiate anything i mean I, I had to step in and help this girl basically try and get out of her lease i mean of course the landlord was like nope you personally guaranteed it we're not letting you out where she signed the lease and accepted full responsibility of a 15 year old hvac unit well, guess what? Six months into her lease, that blew out, and she was responsible for paying for an eight or ten thousand dollar unit that she couldn't afford. It's like, why would you not have a pay an attorney three thousand dollars to look at your lease? Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. Chad, yeah, yeah, I'd echo that completely. Hire a good lawyer worth their weight in gold. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, well, guys, appreciate y'all joining me today. To the audience, we will be back with another episode here in a couple of weeks, and we will see y'all then. I won't curse Take so much. Now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope you curse <laughs> more. That's right. And we need to get the whiskey and cigars going for the next episode too. Yeah, I, I like that idea. I actually uh, picked up a pipe uh, over the weekend because I, I lost mine from a long time ago. Man, I, I enjoy it. I like that more than cigars. We should get some whiskey and smoke some tobacco. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Thank you, guys. I always appreciate you guys. Yeah. Likewise. Appreciate y'all. Y'all take care. See you guys. Group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com.